We are surely blessed to be here today. I'm very blessed to have the privilege that I do to address this audience. It's one that uh, I better never take for granted, a blessing. And I hope all of us feel that way about our opportunity to be here, our opportunity to praise God, our opportunity to open His Word. It is a great privilege, one that many through the years, good people, have, uh, have been denied, one that they've had to risk their life in order to, to exercise. Oh, never to take it for granted. That's in part what we're going to talk about today. Uh, as I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 6. As you do that, let me ask you to keep in mind this afternoon, Lord willing, on the first Sunday, we have our singing in the evening. But uh, preceding that singing, we have classes for those who would like to be a part of that. We have ladies' class. Uh, and we have a men's class in the, uh, in the uh, room down here at the end of the hallway uh, in which we are studying currently the subject of leadership. Uh, we've been uh, using a book on kingdom leaders, uh, loosely at least as a guide, uh, suggesting some of the topics. Uh, but uh, we plan to, this afternoon to, to look in a concentrated way at uh, Samson. And what kind of leader he was. He was a judge for 20 years in Israel, but what kind of leader was he? And uh, we'll talk about Samson today. So what I would ask you to do in addition to reading the book, and of course the fellow there's got some questions for you, for us, uh, is please take a moment to look over Judges 13, 14, 15, and 16. Read over that, and we'll meet this afternoon, Lord willing, in that class at 345, I believe. And uh, I, I do hope that you will make that uh, a part of your schedule when you can. Uh, it, it's, it's encouraging for us. We're looking to grow leaders, uh, and I, I think that the best way we can do that is look in the Bible and learn the lessons about leadership that it teaches. And so to that end, I hope that that will be something that you pray for and something that you participate in. Uh, Daniel <clears throat> chapter 6 is a familiar story about Daniel facing lions. Um, it's interesting, there have been a lot of artists through the years, this is nothing to do with the Bible, but there have been artists through the years who've tried to capture this, this, uh, this scene. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I'm not sure exactly who painted it, but I like to look at the expressions on the lion's faces. We don't see Daniel's face. And uh, some of them are a little bit funny, uh, but uh, it, it really does paint, I think, a picture here. I'm not actually sure how much light Daniel would have had down there in that hole. Uh, I've often imagined that he might have been there in the dark. Maybe that's part of the terror of it. Um, we remember, I suppose, in, in the sixth chapter, the story <clears throat> about how the king, who had been flattered uh, by people who hated Daniel simply because they were jealous of him, he had been flattered and maneuvered, Darius had, he was ruling in, in Babylon at that time, uh, by his, uh, some of his jealous subordinates uh, into uh, creating a law that they knew would condemn Daniel. They knew they, they couldn't get Daniel uh, for a lack of honesty or malfeasance or something of that nature of criminal behavior. So they thought, well, we'll get him somehow in relation to his God. He's faithful to serve his God. So they convinced this uh, rather foolish king to make a decree <clears throat> that... Uh, that you can't pray to anybody but the king. Uh, and uh, they knew that Daniel wouldn't be able to do that. And sometimes in this story, we do concentrate on maybe a scene that we imagine about Daniel in this den and how he would have faced down these lions. Actually, we're not told anything about that particularly. Um, uh, we uh, see in verse 14 how the king, once he realized what had happened, had worked hard to get around the law that he had made. He was not able to do that. <clears throat> and so he, um, he had Daniel taken, brought, verse 16, cast him into the den of lions with this uh, hopeful word, thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. 
They brought a stone, laid it upon the mouth of the den. That sounds like a dark place, doesn't it? And then it was sealed, and the king spent a restless night. We really focus, the, the text does, the Holy Spirit does, on the king's fitfulness, not Daniel. But in the morning, uh, the, uh, the seal is broken, and uh, the voice uh, goes forth from the king, lamentable voice, speaks to Daniel, verse 20, and says, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? And Daniel speaks perfectly well, and he says to the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the, the lions' mouths, and they have not hurt me, for as much as I am before him, innocency uh, was found in me. And before thee, O king, I have done no hurt. That's about as close as we have to a description of what happened that night from Daniel's point of view. How did Daniel face down those lions? Well, I, I, that's what we know about it. But I tell you, to my mind, and maybe to yours as well, uh, the real courage of Daniel was not found maybe in the lion's den. I mean, at that point, what could he do? He was taken, he was placed in there, and at that point it was just up to God, whatever happened next. Whether he stared at him all night or stared in the darkness or shut his eyes or what he did, I don't know. But the real courage of Daniel to me was not at that moment. The real courage to me was what preceded it. We've already mentioned. Um, go back earlier in the chapter. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, uh, th these men, these enemies of Daniel said in verse 5, we will not find any occasion against Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom and the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days save of thee, O king, uh, shall be cast into the den of lions. And now, O king, establish the decree, sign the writing that it might not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. <coughs> Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now here in verse 10 is what I want us to remember. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. He went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. You think he knew what was happening next? The real courage that Daniel showed there, whatever he did in the den of lions, was here. When he knew the threat and he knew it was a real threat and he went and he prayed as he always had. That's tremendous courage. And all of us have, I hope since we were children, if you were blessed to know the gospel or Bible when you were a child, we've heard this great story of Daniel and the lion's den. It's interesting too when you know the book of Daniel, you realize that Daniel was an old man at this point in time. I mean, by this point in time, the Medes and Persians have taken over, right? And so the book of Daniel is interesting that way and in that it follows, really, uh, one man and God's work through him and the prophecies and so on. It's a book that incorporates more than just a few stories about Daniel, but it's a book that covers 70 plus years, the entirety of the time of the captivity because uh, Daniel went to, on to serve uh, Cyrus the Great. And that's at the end of that 70 years. But... <clears throat> You remember also that Daniel, the book begins with Daniel being taken as a captive during the days of Nebuchadnezzar in about the year 606 B.C. And uh, how old Daniel was at that time, I'm not really sure. But uh, people are speculating he must have been quite young, maybe a young teenager, maybe barely a teenager. 
maybe younger than some of the folks sitting in these pews this morning that uh, we have here, our, our young folks. But in Daniel chapter 1, it was in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain children of Israel, of the king's seed and the princes, children in whom was no blemish but well favored, skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. A part of this captivity was taking some of the best young minds in Israel, uh, in Judah in particular. He calls them children in verse 4. That's a term that's not definite. It suggests young people. It could suggest those who are infants all the way up to those who are young people as we think of it. But still, no doubt a young man who is to be taken away from his home, taken to a foreign land to serve now in Babylon. Now the story goes on that the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. And among these children of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We know most of them better by their Babylonian names. You remember Daniel was given the name Belteshazzar, but Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself, verse 8, with a portion of the king's meat, nor of the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into tender favor and love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then should he endanger my head to the king. So Daniel said to Melzar, uh, whom the prince of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said, Prove thy servants, I pray thee, these ten days. Let us have pulse or vegetables to eat and water to drink. And let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countless of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter. Prove them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. And as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of the days that the king had said that he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding, that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even to the first year of King Cyrus, and he sure did. And it was under the Persians that Daniel faced the lions. But I want to suggest this to you. It wasn't the first lion that Daniel ever had to face in Babylon. Uh, I, I got to visit a museum really a great museum not too long ago. And um, by the way, I appreciate the kind words about that study, and, and we're going to try to maybe pick that up, maybe finish it next week. Uh, but uh, in, in reference to looking at some of those Bible artifacts, but that's not our focus today, but just in passing. Uh, they have there over there at the British Museum 
uh, these glazed bricks from the processional way of Nebuchadnezzar's palace. And um, uh, actually several museums in the world have a few of these, and as one in Germany I got to visit several years ago, John now that has a tremendous set of, they've reconstructed the gate there, the Ishtar Gate. But I got to see this, uh, and it reminded me, I suppose, of this story and of a lesson that I'd like to share with you. And I want you to imagine Daniel as a young man, and I have no doubt about the fact, I don't think there's any reason to doubt, he would have come into this great ceremonial gate, he would have walked by this very, these very bricks and all these lions. They don't look very friendly, do they? They're not intended to. You know, capital cities like, like Babylon were intended to be intimidating. You can just imagine, here comes Daniel, a young man, a young teenager maybe, a captive, now going to serve a new master and walking through this tremendous uh, setting here. Uh, what was it Nebuchadnezzar said at one point? Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for my glory and my majesty? And so I want you to imagine Daniel walking through the streets of Babylon, walking into the gate of Babylon, walking by these ceremonial lions that are uh, uh, in the glazed brick on either side. And I want you to imagine how Daniel would have had to face <coughs> challenges, not just as an old man, but from the very beginning. The story we looked at there in Daniel chapter 1 is a powerful story. Uh, it's not as exciting, maybe, some might say, as, as the story about Daniel and the lion's den, but it's the same story when you think about it. Before Daniel had to face the den of lions, he had to walk by the majestic lions of Babylon, and he had to make up his mind, and he had to make his stand known from the start about what he was willing to do and what he was not willing to do. There was this tremendous temptation to compromise. Maybe we can relate to that. Now let me just make this point, and I think it's a point worth making, that compromise is not inherently sinful. In fact, I think it's fair to say, as Christians, we're called to do a lot of compromising. If you look with me in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you know, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he's reminding them that there's an awful lot of giving you need to do. There's a lot of giving in. There's a lot of, of, of being concerned about doing that which makes other people comfortable. In serving Christ, that's true. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19, though I be free from all men, Paul proclaimed, yet I have made myself a servant unto all that I might gain the more. To the Jews I became a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law, not be without law to God, but under law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. I, to the weak I became as weak that I might gain the weak. Don't misunderstand this, of course. When he talks about those who are weak, he's not talking about people who are weak in their commitment. He's not saying, you know, when I was around people who didn't take worship seriously, I didn't take it. No, that's not what he means. He's talking about people weak in conscience. Like uh, he writes in, first, in Romans 14, the weak brother... Who was the weak brother in, in Romans 14? He was a guy whose convictions were so strong, they were stronger actually than the will of God. He felt like it was wrong to eat meat when God did not forbid such. He was extremely strict in his behavior. Now Paul is not here saying it's okay to be sloppy with the service of God if that's the mood of the plate. No, no, no. But what he is saying is, I didn't make things law that were not law. And so Paul, he was a, grew up a strict Jew. He knew the customs. He knew the routine. And when he was with those Jews uh, who he was trying to teach to become Christians, it was easy for him, I'm sure, to be in that situation where uh, he could uh, not offend their consciences unnecessarily. It would have been a little harder when he was with those who were Gentiles. And there might have been times when Paul would have to uh, do things that he was not accustomed to doing. But it was not a matter of law. So he, I can give that up if this will help me win this soul to Christ. 
if it can help me keep this brother in the road. That's the kind of compromise that Paul called on these Corinthians to do. And of course, ultimately what he's getting at is, uh, in, in context, he said, you guys are entirely too loose and careless with idolatry. And you're not thinking about your brethren who are coming out of that background and troubled by the meat sacrificed to idols and so on. Anyway, but the point is, there are times when we as Christians are called on to give up what we prefer. Not what's right, but what we prefer if it's helpful to someone else. And Daniel, no doubt, when he got to Babylon, there were a lot of changes. There was a, a new king. There was a new allegiance. There was a new name given to him. He was given, all I know, he was given to the master of the eunuchs. What does that tell you? There were a lot of things that Daniel may have had to have his life flipped over in regard to. And Daniel was willing to go along. He recognized this all to be a judgment of God and he was a part of it <coughs> to a point. But back in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, Daniel would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat or the wine which they drank. I don't know from the text what it was about that meat maybe it violated the dietary laws of Leviticus 11 in some way or maybe it was some dedication to idol or I don't know what it was the meat and the drink he knew to be defiling I'll tell you where his willingness to compromise stopped when it became a matter of the will of God the law of God the teaching of God and I'm not willing to violate his will. Even on a point like this, it would have been so easy for Daniel as a young man to give up. In the first place, think about the greatness of Babylon. We'll say again, you know, it's, it's hard for us now to imagine, you know, uh, but, but Babylon in ancient times ruled a kingdom that, that really incorporated uh, uh, from... Uh, southern Russia to, to Egypt. Uh, it, it was a huge empire. And, and when someone went to Babylon, uh, maybe it wasn't that much different than going to, to Washington, D.C. You know, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., you notice how the buildings are pretty grand? Our Congress meets in a Capitol building. You think they need all that space? Really? There are 100 senators, right? I think we could fit 100 senators in this building, couldn't we? You think this would do for them? It would not do. There's a message being sent here by the monuments and the government buildings, and it is that we are big and you're not. <laughs> and that we are supposed to be awed by the power of it. It was no different in Babylon. And so here is Daniel coming in to this great capital of this great empire as a young man, a young captive. Far from home. One thing I've wondered about is, were Daniel's parents here? There's no record of them being here. We do have a record of uh, these three uh, other Hebrew young men. But as far as I know, other than that, Daniel was taken away from what he knew. Away from his friends, away from his family. Let me say this to our young people here. You know, you're going to find out what you really believe when you're in situations when you're away from your parents and you're away from folks that know you, how you act then is what you believe. That's true about adults too, by the way. That's true about all of us. We're away from our brethren, away from those kind of influences that are good, and we're putting another crowd. How we act then is who we are. It would have been so easy for Daniel to say, hey, that was my old life. Everything's different now. And it was, it was a small thing, seemingly. Just, just a, you know, you can just imagine somebody saying, let me get this straight, Daniel. You know, we, we've, we've, we've been taken captive. While Daniel was in Babylon, it hadn't happened at this point in time, the temple would be destroyed. Everything that he had known would be turned upside down and ruined, and you're worried about the lunch menu. Really? This is what you think is the big issue? You need to wake up to reality and get up and get on with your... Daniel knew better. 
because this was the will of God. And by the way, you know you can't win, right? What, what do you think is going to happen? Here you are, let's just assume, let's say he was 13 years old. You're a 13 or a 14-year-old captive, and you think you're going to change the king's law because you think it's bad to eat this. Is that what you're saying? But you read the story. That's exactly what happened. He did win. And it's a great reminder that no matter how great the enemies are, if God is leading us, we ought never to be intimidated or to feel outnumbered. Tell you something else. It shows me that a young team can and must stand. Stand on their own convictions. Stand up for what they know and they believe. That's the point of the lesson, by the way. You know what we need at North Bend? <laughs> we need a house full of people who are on fire for God and who believe Him and who will stand for Him. And we need a house full of young people who have no less conviction than their parents do about that. That was Daniel. And I'm convinced that it was the stand that he took as a young man that made it possible for him to make these stands as an old man. And the lions that he faced as a young man and his willingness to stand up for what was right had a direct effect on what he did later. Daniel knew there was nothing small when it came to God's will. And that, that one defeat leads to another. Used the illustration before. I, I, I got to, to uh, visit Gettysburg a number of years ago. And if you go up, up there, you know, and look at that battlefield, it's a, it's a battlefield that stretches out over a number of miles. Uh, and, and people still talk about when they look back on the war, this being a great turning point in some debates. But there's no question it was an impactful battle. And a southern invasion of the north was turned back. The battle was three days. There were thousands, tens of thousands of soldiers, but people still talk about how that on a particular day, the second day of the battle, there was a spot called Little Round Top, and whoever got there first and was able to hold it was able to hold the spot that held the field that really turned the battle. Now that's military talk there. But I think in our spiritual lives, we can look back and we can say, you know, the stand that you took when you knew you were right and everybody was against you, but when you stood up for what you knew was right, might have been one of the most important things that you could ever do in your life because it'll give you the courage and help the next time to do the same thing. And then it becomes a pattern. And then the devil's going to have a hard time breaking you. I think Daniel understood that. I think Daniel knew the importance of small things in that regard. And I think Daniel would have recognized the fact that there are a lot of victories that are lost because we fail to try. What if Daniel had said, yeah, after all, I, there's nothing I can do about this. I'm just going to go along with it. I know it's not right, but that's always a horrible thing to say, by the way. Don't ever let that be in our vocabulary. I know it's not right, but okay. Whatever's coming next is evil. And I'll tell you something else about Daniel. Not only did he have that courage, even as a young man, he made the choice to stand for God when it was not easy. But he was able to do that and not be overcome with self-righteousness. You know, what is self-righteousness? I was looking this week, trying to find some definitions, just secular definitions of self-righteousness. This was one that... Uh, uh, came uh, from the Cambridge, I think, uh, English Bible, uh, English Dictionary, I should say. It's believing that your ideas and behavior are morally better than those of other people. What? Really? That's your definition of self-righteous? Suppose your neighbor is a, an axe murderer. Would it be okay to, to think that your morals are better than his? Would that be okay? Or if he's a child molester or whatever, might, some terrible thing it might be. But that's the way the world thinks, you know. Having conviction makes you self-righteous. 
I think the Bible does a better job of that. I wish we had more time here. But I think about that Pharisee at the temple who said, I thank God that I'm not as other men are. That's what we're talking about. Or the story of Simon the Pharisee, who when this uh, woman came, tears falling from her face, standing in the presence of Jesus and washing, as it were, his feet with her tears and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and bringing her gift and him looking back on her and thinking that's a sinner and not realizing how distant he was from God. That's what self-righteousness is. And here's the point, that when it came to Daniel, there was nothing like that, was there? That Daniel as a young man, had his convictions, but he didn't have to be obnoxious. There's no place for being proud about being right and having no pity toward those in error, is there? To equate being exalted meaning you have to have somebody to look down on or to stand on. This will not do, will it? Adults have a problem with this. I've got a problem with this. And certainly young people can have a problem with this. But that kind of despising of other people is not where Daniel came to. I look back on the story we read a moment ago. God brought him into favor and compassion. When he talked to the master of the eunuchs there, it was in humble terms. As your servants, I beseech you, uh, see, put us to the test. In every way, Daniel's conviction was always restrained by this sense of, of carefulness for other people. He stood his ground, but he didn't have to be condescending uh, and proud and arrogant and hateful to do it. And I think that's the great thing that we learn from Daniel, is that spirit not only of strength but restraint, As we close this morning, I'll say again, what we need are young people and people not so young who know what they believe and who live like it and are not afraid to show it. Young people who will stand up for their convictions like Daniel did, even when they're separated from their parents and from those that they've known in that context. Young people who will stand for right even if they've got to stand all by themselves. Those were the first lions that Daniel faced. Young people who can love those who are erring even while they hate the error. Young people who are on fire for God as truly as Daniel was. Young people who can become older people who will continue to be on fire for God. That's my prayer. I'm sure I'm not alone. May the Lord help us all to learn about conviction and restraint from Daniel. I appreciate your kind attention this morning. We invite you to take your Bible, and take your songbook, I should say, and turn to the number that has been selected. If it be your desire today, to make a stand for Jesus, to stand up and say, I want to be his. I want to leave sin behind. I'll confess him as Lord in Christ. I'll come. I'll be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. And I'm, I'm anxious to be raised to walk in newness of life. If that's your desire today, why not today? Make that choice, and we can help you let us know how. We pray that you please would... Uh, consider if you're here as one who is a child of God and you've not been faithful to the Lord as you should be, that you would make that change today to come back to him if we can again help you in that regard. Let us know how. While we stand and sing, will you come?